ancestors on my uh, father's side. I was getting ancestors from both my mother and father's side, which then I discovered that they were related. You know, <laughs> they had, <laughs> you know, cousins, uh, way, uh, ancestors considerably back in time, but, you know, that they were related to each other, which I never would have discovered if, you know, if I hadn't hadn't entered all that in the computer and then printed out a report. So, hmm. well, anyway, we probably should move yeah, on. Yeah, we probably should get, yeah. It's it's, after, uh, I guess everybody that's coming is here. Yeah, I know. We had something like, what, 22 signups? And... Yeah, we thought more well, people anyway. were signing in, but. Uh, Maybe they're sleeping late today. tonight, today. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, you know, we have people coming in from uh, the West as well. So it is a little bit earlier there. So, um, you know, maybe they'll, they'll come in. Okay, and so we're recording this, uh, just to let you know, and it will be uploaded uh, to our, our YouTube channel. And I'm just gonna share the screen here. So we get an agenda up. Okay, so um, any rate, this is uh, what we're gonna do today. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, announcements to make uh, and uh, Roots Tech 2024 registration is open and uh, maybe Wayne can share your screen and talk a few minutes about that. All right, do, uh, do you have to unshare yours? Uh, I probably do. So let's do that. Um, anyway. It's 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 simple to register. Um, you go to the Rootstech. Uh, it's you know it's run by FamilySearch.org, and so Rootstech is part of that. And they have uh, uh, they have a split thing this year where um, you can go in person or you can do it online. So I just I just registered for the online. Um, it's you know it's basically just your name and your email. Um, and then you'll, you'll end up seeing a screen like this once you register. So they're, they already have content on there um, and, and they organize it with different categories. Um, the, um, they have guides here. You can, uh, you know, to help you get started about what you might wanna see. I mean, there are, I don't know how many. There's 185 topics in 30 languages in here, but there's like 1500 sessions. So, you know, there's a lot you could, you know, there's only a limited amount of time that you you uh, you have, you're not gonna be able to see them all. So, so they have some guides here to help you figure out what it is you might wanna see. Um, and, uh, and they have these popular searches set up here. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's, as you can see here, various kinds of content. Um, all of these are different, um, you know, different presentations. You can choose what language you want to see it in. Uh, they have uh, a list of some of the speakers. Um, and they have stuff from previous years here too. So you um uh some of the stuff has stayed there that they've put online so um it's it's a, a a good way to go back and if you want to see a presentation you click on the catalog you, this is what some of the they give you a little snapshot of the present of the uh, session um there's a link here we you know these are already up there where you can watch them um basically upcoming things about um, the um, about what you know what happens at roots roots tech um, I've never gone in person but uh, yeah, the it's, uh, in, uh, it's in Utah if it's in Utah and that's mainly yeah. why uh, and uh, so this you know when they switched during the pandemic to doing a lot of this uh, to doing things online um, uh, it's made it easy for, you know, I don't know how many in the thousands of people that can attend this all at once. Um, so anyway, that, um, 
like I said, it, it's simple to register. It's free. You know, it doesn't cost anything. And uh, there's a lot of good information there. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. <clears throat> Everybody can see it and, you know, copy it out and and just, you know, if you already have a family search account, you know, just put that in and it goes goes right to it. So you don't even have to create a new account for it. Okay, the, um, the other thing we'll go over briefly is this new uh, 10 million names project from American Ancestors. Um, it's uh, dedicated, it's collaborative, it's dedicated to recovering the names of the uh, 10 million men, women, and children who were enslaved of African descent. And um, I'll, I'll just quickly uh, share a screen here. It's a really cool project. Uh, so the um, this will give you the mission statement, which is basically what I just uh, talked about and read. And uh, it has lots of uh, interesting, um, you can be part of the project by, uh, you know, uh, working on this to try to identify these people. It has really cool maps, like the, uh, gives you a map of the total number of enslaved people in 1790. And uh, 60,000 uh, were free people of color. And it gives you a map to show you where slavery had been abolished and when it was abolished. Um, and so in Vermont in 1790, we had 271 free blacks. Uh, Massachusetts, about 5,000. And you can see where, you know, where they resided. And then you can just... You can go through them uh, each each uh, decade, probably census decades, and it will then tell you. And then when you get to 1860, you know you have uh, almost four four million uh, enslaved people and almost a half a million people, three people of color. So, uh, any rate, it's uh, it looks like a neat uh, neat project. Um, lots of information here, and. Uh, What's interesting, it's all it's run by AmericanAncestors.org, which is the um, website for the New England uh, Genealogic and Historical uh, Society in Boston, the oldest his, geneal genealogy society in the U.S. And um, they have a, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, free charts and templates you can download. And um, you can actually even chat with a... Um, with a uh, genealogist. Um, I know I know I had that up here just a minute ago. Uh, let's see. Yeah, right here. And this is available from nine to five uh, PM Monday through Saturday. So even today, if you wanted to uh, so I mean you can actually you can actually chat with them about anything. Uh, so this is all part of the 10 million names, but it's also whatever question you have. And uh, they can give you some pointers. And then, of course, they do. You can hire genealogists, professional genealogists through them to, uh, you know, to to carry your research forward, if you'd like. So it's a uh, it's a nice service. And uh, both uh, Rockingham and um, Brooks has free access to the databases. Um, if you're doing this from home, you want to search their databases, you need to have a membership. But if you go into the library and use their Wi-Fi account, you can search them for free. And they have a really robust uh, collection of data databases that, you know, cover the U.S., but mainly concentrate on New England. I know Wayne has used them a lot. I used to. I'm not a member to. anymore. Yeah. And Wayne is. So he he uses them a lot. So if you have any questions, he can certainly help you with that. There are a few uh, free databases on there that are yeah, open, true, right? Um, but it's limited. I mean, yeah. you you can set up yeah. a free account and and you can access uh, a yeah. handful of, of their databases, but not all of them. Right. You know, then you have to become I, a member. Right. I actually I actually contributed one to the to the collection a few years. That's back. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I got this crazy idea uh, because of the Wesselhoff water cure that was in Brattleboro for about, I don't know, eight to 10 years in their monthly newsletters. And this was from 18, I don't know, 1846, maybe to 1854, something like that. Uh, in their newsletters, they would uh, create a list of the uh, of the uh, guests that would come to the water cure and would give their names, uh, their dates they were there, and where they were from. And this was in between census years, and sometimes city directories didn't exist. And they came from all over uh, the east and south. Sometimes the southerners brought their slaves with them. And... Uh, so I took that and created a uh, spreadsheet of uh, year by year, and I came up with something like 1,200 people. And uh, I contacted uh, American ancestors and said, would you like this database? They said, yeah, you know, you just need to do this and that. And, and uh, I said, okay, it would be great, but can you make it a free database so anybody can use it, especially if people from Brattleboro were interested? And they said, yeah, no problem. So they were able to do that. And I mean, the, the people that came here were, you know, uh, Henry uh, Longfellow, um, uh, various authors of some renown, they came for the cure, and they stayed for weeks at a time. And Harriet so Beecher Stowe. Harriet, Harriet Beecher Stowe, right, exactly. Eight yeah. months. Yeah, months, exactly, yeah. So, uh, so at any rate, uh, check it out. It might be fun to Peru. You might see some relatives there, ancestors. <laughs> Okay, maybe we should get on with our what we're going to do today, and Wayne's going to okay. start us off with uh, with his uh, presentation. All right, me. Uh... And if you uh, if, if you guys have uh, any questions. Um, I mean, we have such a small group today. Wayne, do you do you want to wait till the end, or have people just ask a question as we go along? Yeah, we could we could ask a, if, if yeah. we could go just do it uh, along the yeah. way if you'd like. Yeah, it might be helpful if you mute yourself so it takes out background noise. But but anytime you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and uh, ask away. <clears throat> so. I have been thinking about this in terms of uh, some of the stuff we were just talking about there just before we started. Um, uh, I, I've been collecting uh, research on the first Blanchard that came to this country, one of the first Blanchards, the son of the first guy. Um, his name was Samuel Blanchard. And so I was curious, um, if to see what kind of descendants I, I could find ab about him. And so I was, the aim was to, to find five generations, um, which I thought was going to be fairly straightforward because as we were talking there, I, I had already had a lot of information entered into a database and, uh, you, you know, could make it produce reports for me. Um, so uh, anyway, um, I never feel like I'm done. Uh, you know, I started this like three years ago now, and uh, each, uh, you know, just recently, I, I find an, another whole little branch that I hadn't discovered before. So I got thinking about what, you know, what is what is reasonably exhaustive searching, researching. Um, and I don't know that I have all the great answers here, so feel free to, <laughs> you know, chime in with your own. Uh, so the definition is just that a, a genealogists attempt to collect all information potentially relative to the questions they investigate. Um, so generally, you know, whatever you're trying to, whatever problem you, you have that you're trying to solve de determines what direction you go. Um, so in my case, I, I limited it to, um, this one ancestor and finding, you know, what I could find out about people that would descend from him, you know, which 
I mean, it doesn't narrow it a lot. There's a lot of people there, as I've discovered going over this for the last three years. But um, it it does give you some direction, if that's what you know, if you know what you're looking for. And so that in turn determines what you know what what you're what you want to find. And, um, usually, it's you know what their life was like, or where they lived, how they lived, the other people in their life uh, is what we're looking for. So uh, the the basic steps are just this, you know, what 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 do I want to know? Um, and, and and you know, it, 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 at least the, you want the basic information, obviously, you know, when they lived, when they were born, when they died, um, if they got married, when that was, who they married, and so on. Um, so figuring out what you want to know, what problem you're trying to solve determines what sources to look for. Um, uh, and then the next step is, is really, and I, I like to feel I'm getting better about doing this. I don't think I, I was so much in the beginning, but hopefully I'm better at it now, is trying to determine which information is the most reliable. Does it come from some primary source? You know, in other words, something that was, close to whenever the event happened and if you know invariably there are conflicts with data that you collect and it, it, you know have um, have you resolved those is you know has there been a way to figure out which information is the most reliable um, so at the start you you want to collect information from all over the place um, so that could be family stories, it could be histories, local histories, um, looking at what other people have found out about the same family. Um, you know, I, I volunteer at the library, so I, I do have, you know, I've had people come in. Um, oh, well, here's a good example. When, you know, one person came in and said, uh, uh, and this is pretty amazing to me, that his, his grandfather, served in the Civil War, and for the family story was that he was taken prisoner, um, wounded and taken prisoner uh, at Andersonville prison, Confederate prison. Um, so we, uh, the, the thing that resolved that was, was finding a, uh, a pension file from the National Archives. And we were able to determine without a doubt he was wounded. Uh, in, in fact, they were never able to remove um, all the bullet or whatever that hit him. Um, but, you know, given all the other information in that pension file, we could determine that he really wasn't taken prisoner of war. So, you know, the family story had a little bit of truth to it, but the further, you know, the more in depth information we were able to prove. Um, you know, what actually happened. Um, anyway, so all the, these family stories and so on uh, give you some hints where, to, you know, where to look um, and then to see if, you know, to see if you can really prove what happened. So just an example here that I've, I've this is a family that's uh, constantly uh, been a problem for me in terms of finding information. So I uh, I was interested in this uh, finding out about my this great grandfather Francis Fisher and the Monroe New Hampshire the history of Monroe New Hampshire in, included the family in um, in the genealogy section of the history so it shows uh, that he. Uh, uh, that he was born in 1835 in, in Walden, Vermont, and that his parents, according to this, were uh, George Washington Fisher and Mary Cole. So I very dutifully recorded all this in my computer database and uh, didn't really question it much. I just said, well, that looks pretty, you know, looks pretty good. Um, and then, uh, 
not all of this happened at the same time, but you know, later on I discovered this um, death record seems to confirm what's in the, the history. It says he, you know, uh, that in, in this record, it shows that he was born in Woodbury, Vermont, um, 19th of March, 1835. So that all sounded good. So in terms of evaluating evidence, you need to, you know, the idea is to collect enough other information and to see if they agree with each other. Um, uh, so you can be fairly confident that you've got the, you know, that you've got some solid evidence. So here's the next thing that happened. This is the death record of Mary Cole Fisher shows that she died in 1886 at the age of 62, which would give her a calculated birth date of May of 1824. So the Monroe history said she was born in 1826. Um, so I, you know, I figured, you know, that kind of thing happens. We don't, you know, the history may, may have it wrong. Maybe she wasn't sure really what her birth date was or the family wasn't sure because somebody had to provide the information to the person writing the history. But then it struck me that um, I would have said it was impossible, but I mean, I guess it is possible that, it, it, that uh, she might have been able to give birth to Francis in 1835, but she would have been only about 11 years old. So seemed pretty unlikely that she was um, his mother, which had never occurred, it didn't occur to me to, up to that point until I discovered this and I was got thinking about, you know, how could that be? Um, so the, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, just goes to show you, you cannot, it's, there's a tendency just to automatically accept whatever you're collecting and the, this evaluation piece might not come until later. I mean, it never it struck me the difference between their ages was only, you know, I, I mean, that she would have been only 10 or 11 years old. So um, to help try to solve this, um, to try to, you know, you, you need to kind of broaden the search. Um, so looking for information, other information, the family, perhaps other neighbors or other associates, somebody connected to the person might help uh, to do that. So here's just one part of the example. Um, this is the next child that was born. Um, so Emmeline was um, age 40 and eight, when she died in 1882. So her birthday was around 1842. Um, so I was thinking, well, if Mary was born in 1826, she would have been 16. If perhaps she was really born in 1824, she would have been 18. So, you know, those seem to be more reasonable ages. And so I sort of was assuming that Emmeline was probably the first child of uh, George Fisher and Mary Cole. It is interesting that the next child was not born until like five years after that. So she's you know i think she's probably still the first one and then th this led me to discover that george fisher had an earlier marriage and had earlier an, an earlier child so uh, i still have not found any direct evidence you know no birth record of anything of uh, francis fisher but it seems most likely that he was probably the son of uh, the first wife she died when he was really young. And so Mary Cole, and it was in all purposes, really his mother. I mean, she's the one that raised him, but um, uh, which I, I assume that that's probably how that all got into the record as her being the uh, mother. I mean, uh, she's not, I don't think she's the biological mother, but she was definitely the mother. So there's that. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of other information, but I just wanted just here's the one other piece here that so in 1880, uh, Mary is uh, 
uh, she's 54, which would give her a birth date in 1826. So she's pretty consistent about that. Um, her daughter is 39. So it puts her birth date about 1841. So if it's true, Mary probably had her when she was about 15. And if you'll notice, George would have been about 34. So he's quite a bit older than, than Mary. Um, and they had a number of other children. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that when you find one piece of information, if you can, you know, it's worth it to find other pieces that seem, if, it seem to, it's to see if they confirm what you already know. Um, or if they don't, then to figure out a way to kind of resolve the conflict. So anyway, I've always, I always have this problem of figuring out, well, if I really found everything that it, it makes, you know, that makes sense to find, um, you know, does it answer our question? Um, in this case, I'm trying to find out who the parents were of Francis, um, uh, Fisher. Um, so, here, I mean, this is my dilemma at this point with that particular family is just, you know, I, I still have a feeling that I probably haven't found all the information I could find just to see if I can put something together that makes a convincing case, even though I don't have a direct information like a birth, birth certificate. Uh, which leads to, you know, finding a wide range of sources, you know, other, what other sources could I find? Um, I haven't, for example, found a probate record, um, or I haven't actually made a trip to any of these little, the various towns that they lived in, in New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, you know, perhaps there's some other records that just aren't digitized. They're not, a, and maybe, you know, maybe there's something there that I, that I could still find. Um, I'm, I'm basically, I'm still trying to resolve the inconsistencies in, in what I've already found. Um, I, you know, I have some primary records there in, in the sense that I have, you know, um, death certificates. Um, but and the census records help, you know, to see if this to show some consistency. Still an open question, though. I still haven't, you know, still haven't figured that one out. Um, I just wanted to throw out one other caution because this, this was kind of a fun one that I discovered here. So here's the record of Norman Odway and Ava Lewis. Got married in Nashua, New Hampshire. If, if you'll notice here, they both, they say they are both 21, um, married by the Justice of the Peace in, in Nashua. So, I mean, it's an original record or copy of the original record, um, which means, I mean, it was recorded by someone who was there. In this case, the Justice of the Peace had to record their marriage. So we know that happened, but the big, you know, the couple themselves had to provide this information. Um, so uh, he was born in 1898. And so he was only 17. And she was born the same day, November 19th, uh, but in 1895, which made her 20. So neither one of them were 21 at the time of this marriage. Um, so anyway, I just, you know, even with records that you think are pretty solid, um, it's, it's worth it to try to find other evidence that corroborates what you know. Um, it's also kind of interesting that they met because he was the milkman <laughs> when they delivered milk to the house. Uh, both of them had pretty difficult lives growing up. Um, she she was living in Concord because she I don't know whether she just didn't get along with her parents or what, but she was living with an aunt in Concord. He was like I said uh, he was he he lived there already. Uh, but uh, had a job as the milkman, and, and uh, would, uh, that's how they met. So anyway, um, I, I, uh, figuring out when things end uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes I just get exhausted and said, I'm not going to look at it anymore. So there's that. 
Um, but, you know, does the research answer the question that we started with? I mean, if it doesn't, you're really not done. Um, if the vital records are not available, you know, can you come up with other evidence? Uh, anyway, that's what, uh, those are some of the things that uh, I, I've been playing around with. So I have, an, I have an easier example here. Well, it turned out to be easier because I could find a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, so I, I just want to kind of quickly run through. I, I was, uh, like I said, I volunteered at the library, but uh, this happened to be a day that uh, nobody came in. There was, and uh, so I thought, well, I'll just pick a person and see what I can find out about them. So I'm starting with just a name, a date, a place, and uh, to see what I could find. So here's the person uh, in the library. Uh, there's a, a a poster with pictures of business people, businessmen in Bellows Falls in 1896. And the only information you have is the picture that you know they were in Bellows Falls in 1896. And we have a name and we have an occupation. So I wanted to say, well, what can I find out about this guy? So, um, I mean, the re research question is just that, you know, what biographical details, you know, like things like, what's his full name? I don't even know that. Um, when and where was he born? Who were his parents? Did he get married and did he have children? Those, those kinds of biographical details. Um, are become the research question. Um, so I was thinking 1896. So his, his ancestry search box, I just typed in what I knew. G.W. Swift, he was living in Bellows Falls, 1896. And then I, uh, fortunately, this came up first. A bunch, several census records here, but what I thought would be most important was the 1900 because it was only, you know, four years after that uh, photo was taken or poster was created. Um, there are a couple other useful uh, uh, census records here. And so it looked, you know, it looks likely that his name was Gilbert Swift. And in the census, um, 1900, of course, is. Uh, one of the most useful census records out there, tons, tons of information. So we know he, he uh, looks like his name appears to be Gilbert W. Swift. He was, we know he, he gives a birth date because he was born February 1861 and that's in the census. Uh, we know he was working as a photographer. So that confirms, the census kind of confirms what we know to start with. We know he married Cora in 1882 because they've been married for 18 years. They have six children, all of them of whom were, were still living, and they're all actually listed right there on the census record. So they would, you know, I mean, it, a lot of the work for finding out his biographical details was done really in this one census record. But it's helpful to you, you know, I, I to get along with doing, uh, is this an exhaustive search? Well, not really, because we want to kind of see if there's other documents we can find to verify, you know, correlate with what's in the census record. So, um, oh, I, f I forgot, I should to back up there. The, um, what was I gonna, oh, but the other thing that struck me when I looked at this was that two children were born in Massachusetts, which means he had to have been living in Massachusetts, and I'm guessing probably about 1885 to 1890, because, um, uh, those based on the kids' birth dates, and then I could find. Then I found that yes, he did live in Springfield, Mass. Because here's the 1891 city directory, and it says right there that he moved to Bellows Falls, Vermont, which meant, you know, probably the year before the directory was published, he had moved, and but they still included him in in the 1891 directory. And then the other thing that helped confirm that was. There's a newspaper item that says he moved from Springfield, Massachusetts, is putting up a photographic studio at the corner of Green and William Streets. 
So it was kind of fun to find, you know, find that information. And then in the Bellis Falls directory, you know, again, this is a couple of years later, 1902, he's listed as a photographer um, that, uh, and there's a Leon Swift, but I later found that Leon is, is uh, uh, was his son, one of, it, one of his kids. Or I think that that was in the, uh, uh, that was also in the census record too. Um, so I, I looked at a couple of the other census records, but they, you know, 1910 was consistent. You know, the information seemed to match the ages of the, uh, there were three of the kids are still, same kids are still living at home. Uh, 1920, it's just uh, Gilbert and Cora, um, but the other information seems to match what we had in the 1900 census. So from that though, I knew, you know, I decided I should look for, um, uh, you know, what I could find for vital records. So uh, this just shows that he, uh, he married Cora. Now we know that her name was Cora Reed uh, and it lists his parents and it lists that he was born in Wilmington, Vermont. Um, so a little few more pieces of information fall into place. And then, especially, uh, well, with Vermont records, it's useful. To, uh, the um, marriage records are split so that there's a, there's a marriage record for the groom and the marriage record for the bride. Um, so this is hers. And so from here, we can get uh, her parents' names. Um, And I mean, well, the data, you know, the other information is repeated, uh, you know, date of the marriage and so forth. But anyway, you know, so you pick up a little more information about her. From that, you know, knowing that I was looking for a Wilmington birth record, so I could, I could find that. Um, and again, the, the parents, uh, it confirms the parents, gives the father's occupation. So a little more detail about the family. And fortunately, I mean, it all seems to, you know, it, everything in these, this, this whole thing so far, the information has been really consistent, you know, the date of birth matches what was on the uh, census records and so on. Um, a death record. Uh, I, I was really kind of surprised to find this in Vermont records, but, uh, uh, you know, they write at the top here that was out of state. It's for a burial in Vermont only, but they created this whole um, death certificate. Um, the one thing that did stick out for me here was that it, it lists his wife as Abby N. Smith. Um, so uh, that was the first inconsistency that I'd come up with. And so then I found her marriage, their marriage record, the marriage record of uh, uh, Abby. And if you can see her name, her name at that point was Abby Crowell, Crowell. Um, but her, um, the, uh, I mean, that created a little bit of a puzzle there. I mean, I was sort of guessing that she had probably, this was probably a married name. And looking for her record, it does confirm that, that Abby Crowell was uh, actually Abby Smith. Her father's name is John Smith, mother's, and mother's name is listed as well. Um, so I, again, and more pieces of information about things that were going on in his life. Um, and it does confirm that this was a second marriage. So, um, so anyway, I just searching around with other things. Um, 
I usually check with find a grave because if I can find them there, sometimes people have put on other information. So it, it shows that he was actually buried in Bellas Falls. Um, nobody provided, a, no, there was no picture of a gravestone, but uh, you know, this entry shows somebody had looked it up and, and uh, uh, found where, where, what cemetery was buried in. Uh, heard, I looked up Cora's death record. Um, same kind of thing, it pro provides some additional information. Um, um, again, things like parents' names are there. Um, the uh, uh, Oh, that she was born, born in Bellas Falls, gives her date of birth. Uh, again, information to kind of confirm what we discovered in the census, but um, that um, uh, it well just to confirm what was go going on, what 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 was happening, and and everything seemed pretty consistent. Then I searched newspapers, and this you know it, uh, especially this time period is good because. Um, you're more likely to find a more comprehensive obituary. Um, earlier times, there was almost nothing. You know, it would if it, if the name got in the paper, it just would just confirm that w when and where they died. This, however, gave a whole you know profile of him. Um, it is one of the things, though. This is 1941, so the most frustrating thing is that. The custom of in the 1940s was to list a woman's name as Mrs. Whatever her husband's name was. So I have I have the four daughters here. I mean three daughters. Uh, but it's just Mrs. Harry Simmons, Mrs. Roland the Cooter, Mrs. Harry Towsley. So I don't know which daughter married which of these guys <laughs> i mean it's helpful to have the good names but it was uh, just kind of a uh, unfortunate thing that they were not very helpful for genealogists in the 1940s when they listed women's names that way anyway so i decided well i should see if i can find their what was what what was going on so here's daughter blanche Married Harry Simons, Simmons, um, and the daughter Florence who was married to Roland Decatur. It's interesting they got they you know they went to Boston, got married there. Marjorie is the one married to Harry Towsley. Uh, then I tried to find what I could about, you know, I didn't do a very extensive thing with the kids. My, you know, the whole question that I started with was to find out about Gilbert Swift. So, uh, you mean, know, obviously this would lead you to other places, but anyway, he, so he was born in Holyoke, um, which kind of confirms the, the time they lived in Massachusetts. And then Ralph, uh, was born in Bellas Falls, so he was born after they came back uh, to back to town. Um, Ralph, I was curious about because uh, uh, he wasn't mentioned in the uh, in his father's obituary. It only listed five kids and didn't and left out Ralph. So I was curious about what happened to him. Uh, so here's a, a, a birth record. He was born in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, the World War I draft cards are good places to find information. So um, he was, you know, gives a little bit about him. It does say he was married. I, I didn't go to the trouble to try to figure out who his wife was, but he, you know, he was married. He served in the National Guard. Um, he was working as an optician and a musician. 
which is an interesting combination in itself. Um, and then, you know, the, the mystery of what happened, it's um, the, uh, <laughs> Ralph died just shortly before his father. Um, and then I did find um, an obituary for him. And, and just a note about finding things, um, I searched on Ancestry, which gives you this transcript here on the left. And, but in order for you to see, if, if you click on the, the link over here on the left, it'll take you to newspapers.com, which is a company owned by Ancestry, but not included in an Ancestry subscription. So it's not in the library subscription and it's not in a home subscription. It's an extra fee. But once I knew what newspaper to look for, the Springfield Reporter, I went into the Vermont Archives newspaper collection that you can get for free on uh, newspapers.com. And then I could find his actual obituary. Um, and that he uh, died of a heart attack, basically. So anyway, just a little bit about searching. Uh, I was trying to flesh out the kind of the rest of the places that uh, I could find Gilbert. So in 1870, um, I mean, he's only nine years old. Um, and, uh, you know, so living with his parents and so forth. Uh, they were in, in Greenfield, uh, Massachusetts at that point. So even even his parents had moved uh, out of Vermont. And then in uh, 1880, uh, Gilbert moved back himself. He was boarding at, for, at a place in Bellows Falls, working at a um, the, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, he was a clerk at the, uh, what was that? The farm. Vermont Farm Manufacturing Company. Uh, I didn't find, uh, and I didn't pursue it very in great depth, but I, I didn't find a probate record for Gilbert, but I did find one that uh, for his father. So that was kind of interesting because his father actually provided a, uh, uh, set up a trust fund. Um, for Gilbert and for Gilbert's children. So he names all of the grandchildren. So that was um, um, also kind of a good way to kind of confirm uh, the, you know, and another piece of information that confirms the kids and how they were related. So anyway, this, I find it sometimes helpful to figure out if I found everything to just put everything into a timeline like this. And I was really kind of amazed at how much stuff <laughs> I could find out about him. Um, pretty much, well, not year by year, but in, in some cases, pretty close to year by year about events that happened in his life. And then from that, you know, you, you can reach a, a uh, you know, reach these conclusions, because I, I had pretty solid information about when he was born, where he was born, who his parents were, um, where he died, when he died, uh, when he got married to Cora, when he got married to um, Abby, and then, uh, you know, information about the, his kids that, uh, that uh, Gilbert and Cora had. Uh, so anyway, I, I, you know, the, this one fell into place very neatly, for, really, for the most part. Um, the um, it, it doesn't always happen so nice, but it, it was kind of a nice time period to be researching because this, you know, you have several census records there um, and and other information that's uh, pretty readily available online, or at least was for this fellow. Um, Anyway, that kind of brings, <laughs> brings us up to. Uh, 
you had a profusion of diverse records. And uh, so most of those records were uh, freely accessible through family search and the newspaper. Well, well, most of them were actually on Ancestry, but they probably would also be available on family search. I mean, since if, if, if someone doesn't have a family search, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, an yeah, Ancestry, yeah, account, Ancestry but, you know, um, the library and use their account. The, um, yeah, outside of that, the, um, uh, what was I going to say? The, um, uh, well, yeah, most of the stuff I, I think would be available there actually on on, on Family Search. The um, newspapers probably would have to go. You'd have to search separately for newspapers. Um, and actually, in in the Rockingham Library, I mean, I was researching online there, but I could have just walked down. You know, I was in the meeting room upstairs, I could have just walked downstairs because they have a whole shelf of city directories for Bellows Falls going back to like the 1900, you know, 1902 one is probably there. I could have looked it up in person, but it was online. So. I um, I put the uh, link on how to get a free account to Vermont newspapers in the chat. So. Oh, good. Just yeah. have to register with Vermont.gov <clears throat> and you can get that. You can get that. Uh, I really like that one I can find. If I can find something that was related to a Vermont, <laughs> I like your idea about, about creating the timeline. You know, What's that? I like your idea about creating that timeline because you can see the gaps in the in the historic record. And did you did you do that with reunion or did you just? No, no, I was just. I didn't. I would have if I, you know, if it was a family, you know, if it was something I was actively yeah. researching for my own, yeah, right. you know, research, but. Uh, this no, I I was just trying to I was trying to see how many you yeah. know year by year how, what what I could find. Yeah, that's great. I think I think Mary has a question. Yeah, um, go ahead. You know, I should have said this earlier, but I have to leave now. But I really appreciate because you helped confirm a lot of the work I've done of you know various steps. Ah, yeah. So thanks great. a lot. Thanks. Sorry, well, thanks I for joining to... us. <laughs> Okay. okay. See you next time. Okay. How about anybody else have a question for Wayne? Uh, this was good. And the newspaper thing is something that interests me um, a bit. The news, would I, is there anything like they have in Vermont, in Massachusetts, where you can search um, without getting a subscription to the Newspapers. Uh, earlier papers uh, uh, for the Library of Congress has a thing called Chronicling America, okay. which is a free, uh, free newspaper website. Okay. Um, I think you did something on that one. In an, you may have mentioned that meeting. before. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, sometimes for some cities, you you know the the library there will have um uh, local papers on you know online okay um i can't off the top of my head i can't think of any i haven't done much with massachusetts for recent newspapers but you know for example the there's a brooklyn new york newspaper that if you go to the brooklyn library's website you can search all of their i forgot what it is the brooklyn eagle or something like that um, I got a lot of good information out of there without having to pay for an account. Um, no, I don't. So, really... I mean, you, you know, you could check with, you know, uh, various libraries and see if they have the local paper on online. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and the, well, you know, you might have to make a trip to the library too. I was going to say, right. you know, like Bella, Bella Falls has, microfilm of the Bellows Falls Times. Mm -hmm. um, although that's also now, it's also digitized on that newspapers.com site, so. Um, but the Chronicling America might be- Chronicling America tends to be early, earlier, you know, early news, early time period. The 1800s. Yeah, maybe. 
Um, How far does the uh, newspapers uh, thing go back? The subscription. Oh. Thing? Well, see, that all depends on the. <laughs> I mean, the t the tough part with searching newspapers is that there's several companies that do that, and um, the. Um, so it depends on what collection they have and what they've digitized. Okay. Um, so it it's helpful to to look at their website and see which newspapers they cover, you know, in what years. Okay. Um, you can, um, you know, for example, the the Chester Vermont Library has. A, um, you, you have you have to use it at the library again, but they they have uh, a genealogy bank, wow. which is you know has a lot of it's a newspaper collection, you know, digitized newspapers, um, which and it also has a really good uh, obituary search um especially for more recent obituaries you know from well recent being uh what the last 40 years maybe <laughs> not really early ones but like say the last 40 years the genealogy bank has a lot of um, it has already extracted um uh, the obituaries from newspapers thank you i'm gonna, I'm gonna share a uh a link that I used quite a bit called uh, the ancestor hunt. And this person's compiled uh, a link of uh, newspapers by state. So like if you. Uh, yep, Massachusetts. Yeah, here's Massachusetts. So these are free sites. And of course, they give you chronicling America. But um I don't know why they have Barry here, but maybe because it's Kronaka Solvercizfa, which was a uh, anarch, uh, a newspaper uh, of uh, of uh, anarchist, uh, an, an anarchist newspaper in Barry. Huh. But so these will give you, um, you know, some of the sites. Google News as well. I don't use it that much. Uh, okay. so at any rate, that's a good one you can check. And, you know, sometimes you can hit pay dirt there. And then I put the Chronicling America uh, link as well. So you can grab that uh, off the uh, chat. Well, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Wayne. So, I've been uh, curious about how to get into some of the newspapers without getting another subscription <laughs> yeah. right now. Yeah. Thank you. More questions. Let me see. Well, we've we've winnowed down to just a few of us. <laughs> so I do have something, but it's was well, it's not as comprehensive as Wayne's, but it it might show um you some of the uh holes in my research, but I didn't realize till I got to my appointment, which I was a uh uh, I'll put it up and, you know, it, it'll, it I'll go quickly so we won't belabor it because it's not, it's not quite an exhaustive search uh, example, but it just touches on it a little bit. Uh, let me get this thing ready though. So this is um, something that I just uh, thought that I might be able to use for this the uh, topic today, um, which was a um, application I've made for my uh, dual citizenship, my Italian dual citizenship. Um, so in um, in Italy has a uh, process. Uh, where uh, one can uh, obtain uh, citizenship. It's called jus sanguinis, which is citizenship through blood. And it's the process by which an American-born descendant of his or her, her Libra, which they call him last Italian-born ancestor, 
may be recognized an Italian citizen. And, uh, you know, Kim, Ireland has the same uh, same uh, thing as well. So, um, you know, if you have a grandfather that was born in Ireland, you would be able to do this. And, and actually, Ireland is a little bit easier than uh, than the process in Italy. And uh, I, I have some information on that if you're interested. But so um, the American born answer must have been born before the Libra naturalized. And uh, because the Italian Constitution, World War II, in 1948, granting women full rights, a law passed in 1992, descendants could now be recognized through their American born female ancestor, ancestor who must have been born before 48. So before that, it was only through the male line, but then in 92, they recognized the Constitution and said, well, women can pass this on. Uh, but the American applying for citizenship must have been born after 48. So there's, you know, there's some, some uh, you know, uh, limitations there. Um, so in my case, my maternal grandfather was uh, Libra born in Potenza, which is... Uh, in southern Italy on January 8th, 1894. My mother was born in Denver on April 29th, 1922. I was born in Denver on August 29th, so I meet all the criteria for my application. So uh, the first thing you have to do once you do a preliminary uh, assessment of your, if you qualify, you got to make an appointment with the Italian consulate in Boston, and it's a Byzantine system. Um, yeah. I uh, I started uh, back in 2021 for six months, and they only released appointments on the first Monday of the month at four o'clock in the afternoon, and it was all online. So you had to register for the uh, system, and then uh, you would you would be presented with a calendar, and every, whenever you saw a green date, you would click on that date, and then they would ask for a captcha, and if you didn't do the captcha right you would lose the appointment because there were, you know, hundreds of people trying to do these appointments. But I finally, in November of 2021, nabbed an appointment for September 14th, 2023. So I had two years to wait for my appointment. And uh, in the meantime, I could gather my documents. So, so these are the documents that are required, and it requires some searching as well. But uh, some of it I couldn't even do because uh, the documents weren't available online to me in Italy, especially Italian documents. So I had to write to the comune, which is the town clerk in uh, in Italy, and for the to ask them to provide a certified birth record. So um, many times this takes a while, but within two months I was able to get it from my grandfather and grandmother. They were both born there. And then I needed to acquire certified birth records from my parents and myself. And that's, you know, you have to go through, you have to find out where you do that. Um, I, there's a, there's a, a, a national system called vital check, which you can do And All this costs, uh, there are fees involved with this, but they're certified and they're, you need to get the full record, which gives all the information in terms of the parents and dates uh, of their uh, births. And uh, then certify married records for my grandfather, grandmother, and my parents, certified death records for my uh, grandfather, grandmother, my father, my mother, the natural, natural, uh, naturalization record or the citizenship certificate for my grandfather, because that's important to know when he, when he uh, naturalized. And all of these need to be apostilled, which is a form of a authentication that only the Secretary of State can do. Uh, and uh, since all of these occurred in Colorado, I needed to get it from the Colorado Secretary of State. And then all of these need to be, all the American documents need to be translated into Italian. Okay. So it's quite a process and it takes a while. And I should say, I actually had to get my marriage record as well. I left that off. So these are some of the records that that came to me from this uh, from this process. The two up above are the birth records uh, in Italy from my grandparents, and the one on the right is from my father. Uh, he was born there. And interesting enough, I cannot derive my citizenship from my father because he naturalized before I was born. 
So I had to use the other line, which was my maternal line. And this is what an apost apostille looks like. So uh, when you send them the original record, they will send you back this document and this seal, which you cannot break, which has you, the apostille and the, and the original record. So all of the uh, American records had to be apostilled by the Colo uh, state of Colorado. So the uh, birth records, the death records, the marriage records, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, here's my um, grandfather's uh, naturalization record and his petition. So the first thing you have to do is do a declaration of intention to naturalize. And uh, you file that with um, uh, your local court. And uh, this is... Um, this is his petition, which is after the decoration, uh, you have five years to make the petition, and he was able to make the petition. And uh, uh, this was done in 1939. So 17 years after my mother uh, was born, he becomes a citizen, which uh, uh, made it, uh, which, which fits the criteria. Um, there is a little bit of a curveball here, which uh, I'll just quickly mention. In uh, June of uh, this year, the Italian Supreme Court in Rome ruled on an appeal um, because um, if you don't fit the exact criteria, let's say I have a first cousin who's doing the same thing, and uh, he's a first cousin once removed. In other words, his... Uh, Mother is my first cousin, and he's the son. So, so it would be his mother, like me, would have to be born after 1948, but she was born in 1940. So if he were to go through the consulate, he would be automatically denied. But because the, the Supreme Court in Italy doesn't function like the Supreme Court here, uh, he could make a court case, he could make a... Uh, 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 a filing in the Potenza courts to uh, to make this appeal, and chances are it would work there. So he so he's going through an attorney in a, in Italy to do this, but since mine uh, mine apparently didn't, except that uh, my mother was born was only seventeen years old when my grandfather naturalized. So theoretically, she would have lost her, her uh, Italian citizenship because when Gaetano naturalized, the minor, the minor children in the family under the age of 21 lost their citizenship. But the consulates don't follow that rule. <laughs> so at any rate, you know, sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. So at any rate, um, they're not looking at that date. So um, I had problems with names and dates, and this is perhaps a result of not an exhaustive search, um, because here is on this, this is, this is the record uh, from uh, the Italian birth record. You can see his name is Gaetano Spera, and the, um, his wife was born An Antonia Pizzichillo. But this is when things start to change when they get to the U.S. So on a uh, death certificate, my grandmother is Antoniti Spera. She died in 1928. She was only um, 21 years old. Wait, wait a second, is that right? No, 31. Yeah. And uh, the marriage record uh, made made the name of my grandfather as Kate and her name as Antonetta Pizzichel. Um, you know, the, uh, my mother's death certificate made him Ga Gaetano Sparrow with an O and her name is Antonetta Pizzichetti. And uh, so as you can see, these things... Uh, you know, can multiply um, the grandfather's death certificate 
was date of birth January 8, 1894. I don't know what this little R is, unless it was just a mistyped R, but you know, it it created lots of questions in the, the Italian consulate official's mind. And I knew this was going to happen. So I created a an affidavit, uh, which is called an Oates affidavit, one and the same person. And I said that variations of names and one and the same person is Gaetano, also known as Gaetano Sparrow, also known as Clyde Sparrow, also known as Kate Sparrow, also known as Clyde Sparrow. And I did it for my, my grandmother as well. And uh, unfortunately, because um, because I only had it notarized and not uh, a judge to review it, uh, they didn't accept it. So I need to I need to have the uh, affidavit reviewed by a judge here, and um, uh, so that's it. Oh, and the other thing was that on the my grandfather's uh, naturalization certificate. He he put or somebody put that he was born February eighth, eighteen ninety four, not January eighth, eighteen ninety four. This is the true birth date. So that created a question in the uh, person's mind. So all of these may have been a result of a non-exhaustive search to find it out, but so be it. You know, these were original records that had uh, discrepancies in them. So and to make it even worse. When they went in for their um, application to get married, it was 1913. Um, they had limited uh, English ability. Um, and the, the clerk uh, in the office in Denver made uh, my grandfather, Kate Spera, made him the bride, made my grandmother, Antonetti Pizzichel, the groom. So there you go. And there was some enterprising uh, reporter. I must have been in the office that day. And he recorded the craziness. And these people had to get married twice when they finally figured it out. And um, what's interesting here is that the county clerk, uh, and I don't know if it had anything to do with it, but his name was uh, Ben Stapleton. If you've ever flown into the airport in Denver, prior to like 1995, you flew into Stapleton Airport. Ben Stapleton became the mayor of Denver, and he also was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, the Ku Klux Klan uh, in Denver had a resurgence in Colorado, uh, and um, they were, they were, they were, uh, the targets there were immigrants, and, you know, maybe he was playing with them, and uh, I don't know, I can't prove anything, but, but, so that added more to the uh, problem. Because um, after my appointment last week, this is what uh, I have to do now. So for one thing is that uh, they want me to, to obtain the application for marriage licenses. So I brought them the app, I brought them this certi certified certificates of marriage or certified licenses, but they would like to see the, the application. And many times these don't exist. But in Denver, luckily, uh, the uh, the uh, applications were sent to the Denver Public Library from the uh, county court clerk's office, and they hold them, and they can make certifications. So I've sent emails off to them for certified uh, for my uh, for these uh, marriage records, and then I mentioned the. Uh, Naturalization document says he was buried on, uh, I'm sorry, he was married on uh, February 8th. You know, in, in Europe, you rever reverse the way that you do this. So this is the month, day, and year. So February 8th, it should be February, I'm sorry, January 8th. And so what I need to do is ask the uh, Comune in Potenza to do a search for a non-recorded non, uh, uh, non -recorded, um, record for February 8th, 1894, that uh, Gaetano Sparrow was not born that day. That negative search will then uh, eliminate that possibility of, an, of, of, an, of another man, Gaetano Sparrow. His name was Gaetano Sparrow, so, but at any rate, so that's one of the things I need to do. And um, 
because there was a second wife listed on the petition, they had a problem with that. But luckily, I had thought about that about a week before I went in for my appointment. So I was able to get the uh, second marriage license and certificate. So they took that. And then and then these in, these uh, name inconsistencies, um, Prisichetti. So I need to provide an amended birth certificate. I don't know if I can even do that, but, you know, I'm going to try. And then um, I had my father's birth certificate. It just wasn't in the documentation. So she took that. And they want the long form for the marriage certificate and the long form for my certificate. So at any rate, that's the story, folks. <laughs> You've been through a lot, Jerry. That, that's definitely an, an exhausting <laughs> search, and it's been going on for two years, but uh, I feel pretty confident. I'm now, um, I've decided to work with an attorney in Italy, and um, because I have this first cousin, this first cousin once removed, he needs to use an attorney, so I'm helping him uh, with that attorney. And this attorney only lives two hours from Potenza. So he could actually drive to Potenza and do the search. So I can get the search on my grandfather done. And see, I only ha I have a 90 day time period here. So all this stuff has to be done within 90 days. <laughs> so you're probably asking me, why am I doing this, right? <laughs> well, That's my reason. It's an interesting genealogical problem. <laughs> my friend, my friend, my friend Jim, who I I went to college with fifty years ago, is here, and I've told him a lot about this. So he's he's heard this several times. But uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's there's a point in time that I may want to go to Italy because the Italian passport gives you an EU passport, so you can go anywhere in the EU and live. You can get health care there. My cousin wants it for his children because he's going to send them to college there for a fraction of the cost <laughs> that he would need to pay here. And um, I have other political reasons. I may want to leave the country in 2024. That's <laughs> <Well> said. <laughs> yeah, 2024. <laughs> uh, well, you've got a great example, though, of... of um problems you run into with with, yeah, uh, with records especially when if the names if, if everything doesn't match up right you know, i mean and especially the whole thing where that their names were reversed and the marriage thing there it's just right <laughs> yeah, i mean she took she took the newspaper article you're not supposed to be able to give them like untranslated uncertified documents but she saw that kind of proved my case <laughs> oh, right. oh, so that actually helped you then it did help me i had it you know, with me so uh, you know so at any rate i, I feel kind of confident i'm going to i'm going to do it but chances are i won't have an italian passport for two years anyway so <laughs> my, my the, the great thing is that my 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 nephews and nieces will be able to do this because they're you know directly that's the line they have to go through so they'll just have to get the documents themselves which i can help them do and yeah, they'll one of them have to go to Chicago, the other one have to go to Miami because they don't live. Boston, Boston is only for New England states. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they all you know they all kind of they all kind of do independent, you know, stuff too. So that's the other thing you have to be wary of. Huh. So, doesn't work like the. Uh... It, it it seems like it should work like adjoining a uh, like the Mayflower Society where, right? You know, once one relative has done all the work, anybody else can piggyback off that. You, yeah. You're basically just saying, hey, you know, prove your relationship to the, <laughs> to the next person, <laughs> to that's the right. person that's already been approved, and <laughs> and, and then you're good. I think you got into all the appointment waits and you know, and so. But at any rate. You know, I mean, it's they're giving you citizenship, so yeah. I mean, you already have the citizenship; you just have to prove it because you never lose it. You know, until until that Libra naturalizes, and then you're then you're stuck. But it's been a great learning experience, and I can I can help other people too now. Yeah. Well, if there's anything, nothing else, people want to talk about, or we can. We can cut this short. I'm, I'm kind of wondering what happened to all these other people. I mean, yeah, it's kind of weird that we had a lot of people sign up, and then uh, yeah, there, there was one email after up. we started, and I just happened to see that, and 
I sent that person the the link to join, but they I don't think they ever they ever uh, came online. So yeah, yeah. Any rate, might I might I might poll them and ask them what happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we never had a this, this much of a. We seem to be you know, back. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks for all your time. Okay. Must be a phone call going on. Somebody, I think Carl was talking. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. We'll, uh, I think you must be on a phone call or something. Well, I, I, I guess I do have one other question. Do you happen to know the address that we should send that other router back to? There yeah, was no... Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I muted Carl. So talking to somebody else. <laughs> so, uh, anybody else have any? Uh, so, yeah. Richard, Jim, you have anything to say, Kim? No, oh, this was a fascinating. Uh, it's an amazing story that you put together there, Jerry. It's <laughs> mind-boggling. That is a little mind-boggling, but. And certainly, yeah. uh, Wayne gave us a marvelous example of a truly exhaustive search <laughs> my goodness yeah yes, and, yes i i also enjoyed both both stories and uh seeing the uh the pitfalls that you keep running into with this uh, often it seems like it has to do with the recorder the person recording the uh the records right. uh, who is you know sitting in the courthouse or something like that but anyway it's very helpful thanks yeah, a lot thanks, thanks jim I think Jerry's was your yours was way more I mean it was much more complicated because especially when you pointed out that they had pretty limited English abilities when they were doing those records. I mean if um I mean they could have clarified things on the spot if they had realized what was happening to it, you know. I mean, even coming into Ellis Island, uh there were people there officials who could speak that language of the of the immigrant they would and, and i don't know how readily available they were but you know they would be able to at least extract that information and and um you know i didn't i didn't even show them the manifest because that would have been maybe another complication but <laughs> and of course yeah. people think names got changed at ellis island that's a myth because ellis island took the ship manifest so whatever the the uh, person buying the tickets for their ancestor or the ancestor himself or herself put their name on the manifest. And that's what that's what Ellis Island took. The name changes came much later, on, you know, like with my uh, grandparents and so forth. So. Do, um, do, what did, do, do you know what your grandparents called themselves? I mean, he had, you had several aliases there. <laughs> yeah, well, How did, you it's know. funny because he was known I knew him. He died in 64. And I never, I really never knew him as Gaetano because he used to go, he, you know, he changed his name on his uh natural uh naturalization to uh to Clyde Sparrow. And that's he went by Sparrow after that, not Sparrow and Clyde. You know, the equivalent of Clyde in Italy is is not Gaetano, but but he was really known as Kite. Yeah. And everybody called him Zikite. Because the word for uncle in Italian is Z. And uh, I got this great poem my cousin wrote about Z kite playing Mora. Do you know what the game of Mora is? You've probably seen it played. In, in, in America, it's played rock, paper, scissors. Oh. But in Italy, they get two lines of men, mainly. And they go down the line, and they're, they're, and they're throwing out fingers. And you got to guess the total. And it's all in Italian. So if you throw out a three... And the other guy throws out a two. The first guy to yell cinque, which is five, wins. Oh. The number of times. And then once the guy gets eliminated, you move to the next guy. And so that's Mora. And and uh, my 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 uncle, uh, my grandfather, Zikite, used to love to play Mora. So I had this great poem that my uh, cousin wrote about Zikite playing Mora with the Irishman. <laughs> it's pretty funny. At any rate. Uh, so, so how did it get? How did it go from kite to Kate? 
Well, that was early on. Was that he, just an um, error or somewhere? Or? Yeah, it was. He probably said, my name's Kite. And they said, Kite, oh, it must be Kate. I don't know, Kite. What's that mean? You know. <laughs> but, you know, the real gre egregious error was he made him the bride. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, know like the, you know, the recorder might have been illiterate, too. Who knows? You know, he might have not known what the heck he was doing, you know. But Yeah, I don't have much enough experience with other yeah languages um I know. I did, yeah, my uh, one thing that struck me though as you were saying that was i had uh i was doing some research in my wife's family and the uh, one of the uh, name was marie uh, maria bouchot and french it was actually a, it was french it was a uh but he was male but it looked like it looks on paper it looks like marie Oh right, but I have I just have a feeling, and it's probably maybe pronounced differently, or somehow makes some distinguish between a way to distinguish between, uh, right, like a male and female name in French, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I that family, I found. They were in New York, so there were New York census records and federal census records. So I had like six census records. Their names were that Bouchot was spelled differently in every single every month, record. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that would be, uh, be a little be a little difficult to to spell right anyway, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, that was the problem. I was trying to figure out who asked those questions. You know, but I don't know if they're here. The two questions in the um, that I mentioned. There was somebody oh, asked right. about how to turn to turn. I don't think that fellow showed up. How to determine the nature of the link between the white and African American people with the same surname as me? I know I have at least one ancestor who owned slaves in Virginia in the 1700s. And then there was another person who said, "Are there guidelines for bibliography and citations of sources?" Was that anyone in the meeting today that asked? That was that? me. Oh, Carl, good. Yeah, we we I can we can make some suggestions. Um, so let me uh, hold on here. I got to share a couple uh, suggestions here. So. Um, You know, creating citations, there are forms uh, um, that are usually recognized as standard formats. And uh, this Family Tree article, uh, Family Tree Magazine, is free. Um, I'll put that, I'll either put that in the chat or maybe I'll just create a little uh, a list that we'll put on the Google Share. But um, it's... Um, really uh, you know important that you you document as you you've recognized what you're you're doing and um he goes through the why you know and uh credibility retrain uh, uh wayne has talked about this identifying new records giving credit where credit is due and grounding your research but here he goes in and what to include so you have to ask these these questions who created the information what the source is the title when the source was created, where in the larger work of the information, the page number, and where the source is. Where is it, is it physically available only or online? And then this person goes through some examples. And um, this is helpful, uh, but um, we can, and they mentioned some places you can go, which is what I, I'll do here. But you can actually, um, there's some other uh, some other um, sites that I'll show real quickly. So there's, um, let's see. This fellow here is named Randy Seaver, and he operates a blog. And uh, he puts up his samples, and they're very, I think they're done, I think they're constructed very, very uh, well of of examples of, 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 uh, of uh, citations. So here he does vital records. So you can act, actually kind of copy and paste these and just change the names uh, to what you're doing, you know? 
So that'll give you some idea about how to cite, you know, like here's a framed marriage certificate, um, you know, vital record from Massachusetts. So he, he has quite a few here as, as templates. So this would be a good one to use. Uh, the, um, the Bible, the standard, what I learned from when I was taking my online course on genealogical research through Boston University is something called Evidence Explained. And it's a, um, it's actually a, you know, like a 500 page book uh, that you have to, you have to purchase, but their website here, they, um, they offer some free, uh, you know, uh, examples, which, you know, you could, you could use, you can log, you can create a login account for this, a free one. And uh, that's a good one. Um, the other one is, did I have another one here? Maybe those were just the two. Let me check real quick here. Yeah, those are three of them. So those are the three that I would recommend. And um, I'll, I'll put those uh, in a, in a, in a, in a supplementary document that we'll put on the uh, in the Google Share folder for people. Okay. Anything to add, Wayne? The only thing I would add is one I found helpful is called a, a guide to genealogical writing. Uh, I put it in the chat there by uh, Penelope Stratton and Henry Hoff. It, it's uh, published by uh, AmericanAncestors.org, um, and it also has some examples in uh, in the the appendix there that I've. Oh, I kind of follow, you know. I mean, the ones you've already, uh, you've already listed it. Look great, you know. I mean, this it's a similar to in this book is similar to. Uh, what if we should get? Uh, what if we should get Brooks and Rockingham to buy that book? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Have it available for? I, people. I guess I'd have to check and see what's available. You know. Yeah, that would be good to have, to do. It just it just has you know. I mean, it goes through writing, a, if, if you were going to write a family history, kind of helps with that. But um, in the appendix, it has all kinds of examples for citing your research, right. citing the sources. Okay, well, I think we covered the world here. So uh, I think we're going to try to do our um, next one. Uh, on, uh, I think I got it here on the, uh, oh, here, I didn't put it down. What did we say, uh, Wayne? Uh, I, first, I think it was the first, first, first Saturday in December. And that's, I think that's, uh, I think that's December 2nd, right? I don't remember now. December 2nd. Okay, cool. So any well, ideas people have are more than yeah, one. really we we kind of we kind of <laughs> scramble for ideas at the last minute and we're you know we can always come up with something but it may not be what you guys are interested in so <laughs> let us know. This um, turned out to be quite interesting. This whole thing. I think, I think you gave us one uh, how to organize. So. <laughs> uh, there might be one. I mean, what do you do? I mean, you've got all these citations and all if you collect them yeah. and I end up putting them all in some sort of a you know a page document but well this is the value of the um of the genealogical software because you can you can add those uh you can add them to um your um genealogy you know your uh your people um let me just do yeah, it I, that's oh, been oh. the biggest thing to, for me to help stay organized is just when, when I when I'm adding stuff to the computer you know database right um, especially now that I'm trying to create a book out of it um, I also add this you know I, I you can actually attach a footnote well, with a link to the source in in the software itself so here's an example from uh, family tree maker so each one of these uh, the name the the birth has has a uh, a citation. So if I click on about 1779, I can go through here and create the citation. And this follows this person. So when you do any kind of report, 
this citation will come out and you can add a web address so you can go back to it very quickly if you want. Uh, I don't, you may not be able even to see this, what I just did. I don't know what's, uh, cause uh, you know, when there's a pop-up um, sometimes, uh, so I don't know, let's see, maybe you can see it now. Uh, there's a, uh, and this is where you can, and you can create templates so you don't have to start, you don't have to keep repeating what you, what you've entered. And so when, when you come up here and you want to do a report, you can go to publish and then you can create your report um, very easily from that. So at any rate, I'm a real advocate for this genealogy software to keep all this stuff together. Started yeah, to yeah, do some of that, different. but it's hard to organize it. Yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> um, one other thing, I don't know, Jerry and I were talking before that we started here about uh, in connection with that um, that new project uh, about the 10 million Oh yeah, names. So, um, I, uh, I was, the, um, I, I was just recently, like yesterday, day before, I, I had, um, I was researching this family, and I just, and I was really struck by uh, this fellow that, in his will, freed his slave. Uh, at age at age 25 so I don't know how old he was at that point but anyway the uh, I finally found the date Jerry it was uh, he he wrote the will in uh, 1781 so it was before the, I was thinking it was the, yeah. this was the father of the person I was searching so that's why I was thinking it was in the 1800s but right right well that would be so he so he died uh, well the will was approved in uh, April of 1782 and so I don't know how much I don't know how old is. Uh, yeah, but it was before the. Um, well, he called him a servant, a Negro servant, but still, you know, he was basically freeing him. Right. By you know that his his heirs, in other words, his kids, could no longer, you know, get free, <laughs> free servant well, labor. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, so it was all adult uh, males. It didn't extend to children. Uh, or women, I believe, uh, in the in the in the Vermont Constitution, which was 1777, right? It was, yeah. So that's my. Well, that, this was in uh, Andover, Massachusetts. Oh, I'm sorry, Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, that's the difference. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it, you know, it's just uh, it, it was bugging me that I couldn't remember the date. <laughs> So you've got a lot of dates to remember. Okay, well, uh, we've kept you uh, hostage long enough. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully we'll see you on December 2nd. I'll get this I'll get this video edited. I'm sorry I didn't I didn't start it recording right away so we could have captured some of that discussion early on, but all the presentations are there. And that'll go up on the YouTube page and we'll release it to BCTV. Um, and they'll broadcast it. They're real, they they like they like content. And uh we'll put we'll put the uh, resources up on the up on the uh uh Google Share site. That's great. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Hey, and, uh, <laughs> I just want to make a a, a, th a a final uh thank you to Brooks Memorial Library for the use of their zoom account and the rockingham free library that uh we'll do it next time we we switch every other month and uh, otherwise you know we wouldn't we, we'd be limited to 40 40 minutes <laughs> with a free <Yeah>. account <laughs> very valuable to have their support okay all right thanks See you guys later thanks bye everyone bye bye bye, -bye. Yeah. bye. Ciao. ci vediamo <laughs> <laughs>